you. Uh, so first, I guess I should uh, say I'm, I'm sorry I was late. Uh, I can blame Boston Airport or British Airways or a bunch of other people. But uh, to thank the people here, thank you to Elizabeth, thank you to Philip for keeping me wired in the car. <laughs> so it's the first time I've been in a car that has wireless, and so I could uh, check out everyone's presentations before you did them, so it was very useful. Um, I, I, I also want to say that uh, I have no slides today, so uh, you're going to be forced to look at me and not at the other screens, uh, unless, of course, Ryan decides that he's really going to treat you all and put my picture up on the screen. I, I'm not sure if that can work here, but uh, I'm not sure that's a good idea after I'm just jumping off the aeroplane. But... Um, uh, it really is great to be here, and it's great to be on a panel with people who actually do this work and don't just talk about it. So it really has been nice to listen to both of you. Um, Amal, I have a, this is the first time I've heard you. I've heard Tim many times, and uh, it it's really is good to kind of learn from people who've been there uh, and learn about the egregious mistakes we make as well as some of the successful things we do. Uh, discussing PFM in countries when you don't invite the country just seems to be a pretty basic issue that we keep getting wrong. So uh, the, the difficult thing for me of listening to this kind of presentation is, you know, I was here I think three or four years ago and maybe three or four years before that. And I have to say that the themes don't change and a lot of the problems and a lot of the lessons don't change either. So uh, one of the things I'm gonna talk about a little bit later seem to be in short supply in our community and that's called feedback loops. Meaning we, we, we monitor, we hear, but does it feed back into our processes? Do we have the ability to take the lessons that come from meetings like this, take them back into our organizations and say, let's change the way we do business? So, uh, speaking about successful change. Um, in the last uh, year and a bit, I've been uh, really uh, trying to understand successful reform. I spent a lot of time in my work uh, uh, since I've become an academic uh, looking at unsuccessful reform and uh, waving the flag of critique. And uh, in the last year and a half, I've spent most of my time on the other side saying what works and why, genuinely. And not only looking at PFM reform, but because that's my bias, I spend most of my time looking at that. And th there are two things I want to speak about today. The first is what is successful change? And the second thing is uh, how do we get there? And hopefully some of the recent research I'm doing can help us think about both questions. Now, the first one I'm not going to spend a lot of time on because I was following yesterday in Boston the, the tweets coming from here, and I could see a, a theme of function over form. We need more functionality. We mustn't be just changing the way things look. So it seems that everyone is kind of on that agenda. But I have to tell you, when I'm looking for functional successes, it's really, really hard to do. And partly because the stories we tell are not really about that. They're often still about the form. And I think it may be that we don't have many functional successes to speak of, but I think it may also be that the language of functional success or the metrics of functional success are things that we haven't thought hard enough about. So the first thing that I found myself doing when I'm looking for successes is scouring cases or getting hold of people and saying, you were in something that was successful, tell me about the success. And, and the thing that they'll tell me about is all of the changed forms. Now, I know that they understand the form versus function, so I'll say to them, tell me about the functionality. And they say, well, there is extra functionality, but we just can't tell you what it is, or we just can't measure it. And it takes a long time to really get into that conversation of, if, if we really want to focus on functionality, and that's what success is, then we need better measures of it, and we need to understand what it is that we're going towards. So the kinds of things that uh, I've been looking for in the last little while in the PFM space would be uh, places where they improve procurement performance, meaning that textbooks that weren't delivered for 10 years previously are actually delivered now and maybe are delivered for four or five years and maybe delivered better every year so that there's positive adaptation rather than negative adaptation. Or where the gap between the announced budget and the actual executed spending is, 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 is narrowing over the years. That looks like functionality to me. Or in a situation where perhaps uh, civil servants who weren't being paid or weren't being paid on time are now being paid or being paid on time. 
functionality. And those are the things that I've been looking at. I've been asking some of my friends, some in this room, is what would your measures of this be uh, as part of this project? But I think the first thing is, what is success? Can we measure it? Can we really conceptualize it? Because if we are going to go function over form, we need to know what we're talking about. And we need to have that lead the conversation. And uh, that's the first point. Then the second thing is, well, if we identify some of these places where they achieve more functionality, uh, how did they do it? And there's two theories here that uh, uh, dominate my discourse in my head. The first one is the theory that goes something like this. We start off knowing what it is we want to do. We have a solution in mind. And we plan that solution out really, really well with really smart people. Okay? And we identify exactly what our milestones are going to be and exactly when we're going to do it and exactly who we need to hire to pull the thing off. And then we implement it as planned. And we disciplined and we focused and we have some visionary at the helm, some champion who keeps our boat going in the right direction. And we end up producing the thing that we wanted to and that thing just happens to uh, oftentimes give us a good P for score too. That's one version of, of effective change. Now, about 20 or 30 years ago, people would have given that the name the blueprint approach, which is let's have a blueprint to do the thing and let's damn well do the thing as we say we're going to do it. Okay? And I'm, I'm setting it up as a bit of a straw man and I'm setting it up. Obviously, people who know my work would know that it's the thing I've been critiquing for a long period. But I don't want to put it out there in a negative way or a critical way. I want to say this is a way in which many projects are done very, very well. And it's a theory that we have about doing PFM that drives the way international organizations think about this and work about work, work on this. Okay? The other approach is something that says, well, we started with a problem and we kind of feel around and look for solutions. We have different alternatives and we try them all out and we monitor how things work and we learn lessons about what works and we also learn lessons about why those things work and we learn lessons about some failure too and after a while we come up with some type of solution uh, and that solution is more of a hybrid than a best practice because it's put a bunch of things together but it works and the process is not necessarily led by a captain but it's led by a group of people who do a bunch of different things at different points to move us ahead uh, and it's a lot more messy than the first one, okay? Now, uh, in the 1970s, the 1980s, the work of Corton, they called this the, the, uh, the learning process approach, okay? So contrast to blueprint learning process approach. I'm very sad that they gave that name to it because mine is much better, the problem-driven iterative adaptation. Uh, but people who in the room would know that this is pretty much kind of where, where my work has been. So if you say, well, there's the blueprint approach, there's the other approach. If we can identify successes, why don't we ask a very simple question? When we go back and we look at how they happened, which one do we see more of, the blueprint approach or the PDA? Okay. Do we see them starting with solutions and just implementing them with someone at the helm, just keeping the ship moving ahead? Or do we see a more messy process of a problem that brings people together, that motivates change, and then a process of finding and fitting the thing that works there that involves lots of people? So I've been doing some work with the United Nations University out of Helsinki uh, where we've been looking at this and trying to explain what, what I would call positive deviance in public sector reform. And a lot of these reforms are in the PFM area and there's no surprise because I think most of the evaluations of pub public sector and governance work says that PFM kind of works better than others, although that is up to a dispute. And so in the work, here's the answer. There's a bit of both of those things going on kind of disappoints me sometimes, <laughs> but uh, it, there's a bit of both, and we have to be honest about this. But let me explain to you when we, so the research is in a recent paper where part of the research we looked at 30 different cases, and I won't go into the methodology because it'll bore you, but what I'm going to say is this is what the general picture of a successful reform, meaning one that delivers greater functionality, what it looked like. Okay. So it generally started with some kind of problem. Generally, there was some problem, some performance deficiency that pointed to a lack of functionality. So the kinds of problems would be uh, the textbooks weren't being delivered. Okay? Uh, and someone then looked at the fact that the textbooks weren't being delivered and said, this tells us something about the procurement process that we actually need to pay some attention to. Or the salaries weren't being paid. Okay? 
or uh, we had a big corruption problem. Usually it was a specific thing that uh, blew up uh, and, and, and drew people's attention. Okay? Now here's the interesting thing about these problems as I see them. The first one is that oftentimes they weren't, the, the, the problem didn't facilitate change at the point of crisis. It facilitated change quite a bit after the crisis. The other thing is that it didn't facilitate narrow change, it facilitated fairly broad change that went beyond the immediate problem. So sometimes you would have a problem with procurement in textbooks leading to a much bigger procurement reform, not just of the textbooks. So one of the things that I was interested in is kind of how did that happen? And oftentimes you see people behind the scenes doing what I would call constructing the problem, using data and using stories to draw attention to it and to say, okay, here's the story with textbooks. This is the precise number of textbooks that were missing or that weren't delivered. But we also have the same problem with bicycles in the postal service. And we also have the same problem with this. And we also have the same problem with that. And you're taking a narrow problem and you're making it a bigger thing and you're saying we need a systemic change. But this often takes a little bit of time and often lags the crisis point where the thing hits the newspaper. So the first thing that I see is a bit of artistry with the reformers who take something that is kind of like a moment in time draws attention and then they make it bigger. And they make it something that they can mobilize a lot of attention around. Okay? Now at the same time, in all the cases, I didn't find that there were just problems. I found that there were usually a bunch of ideas about what to do about the problem. At the, at the start, it wasn't, these, these didn't just come down the line. So there's something about the blueprint approach. There's something about having some solutions in mind. But notice that I didn't say solution, I said solutions. In most of the cases where we were looking at, the people didn't start saying, well, we have a procurement problem and what we're going to do is we're going to create an independent agency or we're going to create this. They said, gee, there's five or six different ideas on the table. That's really interesting. We have a lot to work with. Now, in some cases, there was one solution that was working, but usually that was where people had been working on this for a number of years before and where the problem was very specific and very technical. Okay? But that isn't most of the problems in PFM. Most of the problems in PFM involve many organizations, a large portion of the government, and are very complex, and they require a lot of ideas, and I think that's what we see in the cases. So that's really how they stopped problems with some ideas and people kind of putting these things together, drawing a lot of attention, mobilizing people and saying, we really need to do something about this. I think when Amal was speaking about buy-in, this is what this does, is it gets people in the process uh, early on. And I'm going to speak about whether it's insiders or outsiders in a little while. The second thing is, you know, what happens then? Do you go into a blueprint approach where you say, let's spend the next two years planning out what we're going to do about this problem? No. We didn't see that at all. What we saw was immediate action in every single case. Immediate and consistent iterative action. Meaning that people started to do something. And sometimes they started to do very small things, but those very small things allowed them to see what the context looked like. So they would try something and they would see what the political resistance looked like. They would try something and they'll see what the capacity constraint was that would hold them back from moving further ahead. And you didn't see capacity building in terms of uh, workshops where you would train people. You saw capacity building where people were trying something, learning about it, saying, gee, we now need to learn a little bit about Excel. Going on an Excel training and then coming back and saying, oh, we can now do the thing we tried the first time around. So it's what in the private sector you'd call on-the-job training. I don't know if we have that in the public sector. I don't know. So I saw a fair amount of, 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 of this, where trying many things, uh, often in small bites, building your capacity as you move along, that in almost all of the cases there was an emphasis explicitly on delivering quick wins on making sure that you did some small things up front, whether it's producing a new report that uh, provided more information about the problem than we'd had before, or whether it was actually uh, uh, in one or two schools delivering the textbooks for the first time ever on time. Okay? Small things that you could actually do. And one of the reasons for this is simple, what? Political support. You're not assuming that you have it, you're assuming that you need to build it and building it gradually as you move along. What we saw is that in that process, they started to learn about what worked, they started to learn about why it worked, and they also started to develop the capacity and the political support to pull the thing off on a bigger scale. But here's where it became interesting for PDA. 
Most of those cases, it then moved into a much more formal project process. Once they had some idea about what they wanted to do, there was a process of locking, where people said, now we have to scale it, or now we have to diffuse it, or now we have to deepen it, and now we have to use a more blueprint approach to do that, right? We need to actually think about this very, very seriously, and we have to put a process in place where we do it in a more disciplined way uh, and where we uh, use uh, m m more linear management techniques. And in most cases, you had this kind of transition into this <coughs> formal phase. So again, it's a little bit of both, right? Now, the third thing was, you know, who was doing this? And remember the two alternatives. The one is that you have a champion at the helm, and the other one is that you have a multi-agent multi group, which is what kind of I see in most cases. In every single case we looked at, we had a multi-agent group. In every single case, there were people providing different functions that all involved leadership. Okay? The kinds of functions we looked at were, one, who was it that was defining the problems? Now, that's a leadership role because coming up with a problem and you know, trying to say, say to people things are going wrong is sometimes a risky endeavor, especially if you're in governments and sometimes if you're in international organizations too. Second thing is there were people who came up with new ideas. And bringing new ideas to the fore is also potentially a risky thing to do. It's also something that takes time away from your normal job. So it requires people to stretch themselves to do that. The third thing we looked at is, as a leadership function, was having auth exercising authority and, and, and using the authority to allow this to move on. The fourth one was motivating and inspiring people, the kind of charismatic leader thing. The fifth one was um, uh, 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 empowering agents. So if agents came and they said, well, we need training, actually giving them the training. Or if they said, we need to be able to go and see what's going on in this country, actually allowing them to do that. Okay, leadership function. Giving them money and other resources. Convening teams and connecting people together in the process. Those are the functions. Now we looked over 30 cases and we found that the average number of people playing these, these roles was 19 in each case. Meaning that there's a lot of space for a lot of leadership in reform. And not only a lot of space, a lot of need for a lot of leadership in reform. Now, the other side of it is in about half of the cases, we did find that there was a champion. Uh, so, essentially, I had students blindly coding the cases, and I had two students who'd never seen the case, and they had to say, was there an outstanding leader? And then they had to identify who that was, and it was really interesting because the bias in the cases I use cases to teach with is always towards having an outstanding leader because when you teach something, it's really useful to have a protagonist, right? students like to kind of think that they are that person. Um, so I thought, you know, 30 out of 30, we would have that. We actually only had it in 12. It's really interesting. In a bunch of them, in about eight of them, the students said there was an outstanding leader, and then they identified different people, which is really interesting in and of itself. And in other places, they said, no, there wasn't an outstanding leader. But where the champion was in place, we then, because I could look at what functions these people did, I could map to see, did they do similar things in different cases? And startlingly, they absolutely did. The champions did three things reliably. The one thing is that they gave authorization for the reform. The second thing that they <coughs> did was they convened teams. They convened teams. And the third thing that they did was that they motivated and inspired people along the way. Now, it's a really interesting thing because they didn't do a bunch of other things. It's not that the person who was the champion, the captain, was defining the problem, identifying the solution, giving the imp Im information on how to implement it, <coughs> providing the money, or even empowering the agents. That was being done by other people. And it almost seemed that in the cases that we looked at, that the champions understood precisely what they needed to do and precisely what they shouldn't be doing. And that they understood that they needed to get people to do those other roles. I think it's quite a powerful and interesting lesson. So the question is, what was the role of the outsiders? So we purposefully <coughs> chose cases where there are outside organizations involved in every single case. Because a lot of people would say, well, of course you're going to find this if it's kind of a domestically inspired agenda. But we found that outside organizations can play nicely <coughs> even when the agenda is domestically inspired. Even when 
the agenda is about solving local problems and not necessarily introducing external solutions. The number one thing that the outside agents did was provide money. Now notice, the number one thing they did was provide money. Not provide money to go behind their ideas. Provide money. Provide money to support when the support was needed to go behind the government's ideas <coughs> for what they wanted to do. The two other things that we did see them doing, the one was sometimes um, providing some ideas, okay? But it wasn't the idea, it was one of our, the ideas that could be provided. And the other thing was acting as connectors or conveners. In some of the cases, it seemed that the outside agent, and I think this goes a little bit to Tim's presentation and the idea of the, the kind of trusted confidant, maybe a, a, an outside agent could have trust amongst multiple agents and help them to engage with each other. But that wasn't, that wasn't as, as frequent as I thought it might be. So there's lots of PDA. There's lots of what I think is the way that this should happen. And then there's a lot of the blueprint approach too. And it's about, there's an art to getting successful change happening. It's not about one or the other. It's not about some routine way. I think it's partly about starting with problems and allowing yourself some flexibility to find a solution that fits. Where and in that process to build the capacity to pull it off, but then knowing the precise moment when you need to bring a lot of money in and lock the thing in and actually bring discipline into the system. It's about having a lot of people engaging, providing leadership, but having someone who maybe can, can, can steady this thing along and ensure that the authorization is there when you need the authorization because it does matter. Um, and it certainly is about... Um, uh, uh, having, having these groups work and someone convening them. So, you know, the, the final thing that is interesting to me when I looked at this is in the two models, in the blueprint approach, you would come out with some clear-cut best practice. This is the solution we were after. And, and, and it's an incentive, I think, that we create in many countries because we have the measures like PIFA that do kind of say this is what good practice is and this is what, you know, less than good practice is. So what we looked at and said, well, what did they come up with? Did they come up with what people said is the right thing or did they come up with something else? And the answer again was both. <laughs> is they came up with something else that allowed the functionality, but usually embedded within that was some elements of the international best practice that were part of the solution, but also allowed them to have the legitimacy outside to be seen to be doing something that, 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 that could be seen as respectable. Now, this is really interesting to me because Eleanor Ostrom in her work on institutional development said that most institutions develop through a process of bricolage, mm -hmm. meaning that you take from a lot of different places. And I think if she were kind of here, and I don't want to kind of, you know, uh, assume that I know what, what was in her mind when she was writing these papers, but she would say something like this in PFM, is the best practice ideas have a lot of significance in the discussion. If you can break them down and find out the parts of them that actually travel to the places that you want to go to. And if you're willing for those parts to be meshed and merged and, uh, and mushed up with some local content that actually gives them life and makes them work. Okay? And that's what we see in these cases. So let me conclude by saying, so what? Which is, I think it's a good thing to say, so what? Um, here's the first thing is, I think that... Uh, we do have successful reforms. I think that we do have successful reforms, meaning reforms where we improve functionality. I think that they are still the exception rather than the rule. Okay? And I think that we, we, we can't prove that I'm wrong because we don't have very good metrics of what functionality looks like anyway. So anybody who wants to take up that challenge should do the first thing that we need to do as a group and as a community is work out what functionality means and create measures of functionality that matter so that we can actually put some meaning behind this function over form agenda. The second thing is I think that we have some evidence about ways in which success happens. And I think that success does happen when you have a problem. And it does happen when you have a process that allows flexibility up front to find solutions but then also at the right moment allows you to come in with enough scale and enough discipline to actually implement it. I also think that we know a little bit about the people factor. I saw some of the text coming, uh, the, the, the tweet, tweets yesterday saying we don't know about the people factor. I think we do know a bit about it. We do know that you do need a lot 
of leadership to make these things work. And we know that that leadership can't come from one person. And we know that we need to build these leadership teams and they need to include champions, but those champions are part of the solution, not the solution itself. The final thing I think that we know is we do know that these solutions sometimes look a little bit strange. And sometimes they're not what we think uh, is the best practice or sometimes not even the good practice. But if they are the functional practice, we need to start getting comfortable with that. My favorite uh, uh, picture here is instead of a hippo, we need to accept that maybe we need a camel in the Sahara. It might be smelly and it might not look that good, but it works. So that's the end of me. Thank you very much for listening, and um, I look forward to any questions.